Hello, welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Taro Leppanen and joining me today to discuss the new film E-Team is Peter Bukhart, who is the Emergency Director at Human Rights Watch and an expert in humanitarian crisis. Hi Peter, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And the Human Rights Watch just released a new film called E-Team and you are uh, one of the leading characters in it. Um, would you tell us a little bit about the film and what's it about? Yes, um, actually the, the film is not released by Human Rights Watch. It's an independent documentary about the work of Human Rights Watch. Uh, we felt it was very important um, that this was an independently produced um, look at the work of Human Rights Watch. Um, we didn't want to create some infomercial in-house. Um, so about five years ago we were um, approached by um, an Academy Award winning um, documentary filmmaker who wanted to follow us around for a few years um, and make a documentary about the work we do. So um, in making this film, the main objective was to showcase the work that Human Rights Watch um, do in different parts of the world <coughs> right now? So um, the f documentary filmmakers wanted to follow us around um, and give the audience a flavor for the work that a small team at Human Rights Watch, our emergency team, um, does working in conflict zones. Um, and when they approached us, um, we, we said that uh, we, we would give them complete independence, um, that they would be able to go with us wherever they wanted to go. Um, and we also give them access to our private lives. They also filmed us um, with our families and doing advocacy work back home because Human Rights Watch, we do the field work investigating human rights abuses. Uh, but then obviously when we come back, we also meet with government leaders all around the world um, to share our findings and to try to get them to act to, to stop the killings or um, intervene in some way um, to stop the abuses. And um, as the emergency director at Human Rights <coughs> Watch, um, a lot of your work puts you in dangerous situations. Um, have you ever asked yourself if it is worth the personal risk? Certainly. Um, one of the people who actually filmed the E-Team documentary was Jim Foley. Um, who was the first journalist beheaded by ISIS in um, Iraq and Syria. Um, so we do face real risks when you step into a conflict zone uh, where indiscriminate killings take place. Um, you have to be concerned about becoming a victim of those killings yourself. Um, but Human Rights Watch, uh, we very carefully train the people who do this work, um, both in security as well as in medical assistance because if somebody is wounded on your team you have to be able to help them. Um, and we take very big security precautions before we go to these conflicts. But the reality is that in many of these places the world would not know what is happening unless we go there. Um, I've been working for the last two years in the Central African Republic and um, I can guarantee you that the world would not be paying any attention to the Central Af African Republic except for the fact that Human Rights Watch has been working there and documenting and exposing the killings that are taking place. And um, with your groundwork in the Central African Republic, um, as you said, there's been very limited media coverage um, on it even though the situation has been ongoing since 2013. Um, what are the main human rights issues taking place in the country right now and what um, can the international community do to address them? Well, the Central African Republic, even though most of the world doesn't even know this country exists, mm -hmm. um, is probably the closest Africa came to a genocide since the Rwandan genocide 20 years ago. Um, a Muslim group called the Seleka took power in the Central African Republic in 2013. Um, Muslims are a very small minority in the country, only about 15% of the population. Uh, but this group ruled through absolute terror. Um, they burned down entire districts um, of the country, displacing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and by early, late 2013, after a few months in power, a new group formed itself called the anti balaka um, They characterized themselves as self-defense units. Uh, but they really went um, on the offensive against the entire Muslim community, not just uh, the Seleka rebels, and tried to carry out genocide and ethnic cleansing in the country. 
Um, so very quickly, we were faced with a situation where hundreds of thousands of people were fleeing their homes. Thousands were being killed. Um, and it was really important for the international community to act very quickly. Um, and that is what happened. Uh, we drew attention to the crisis through um, our work on social media. Uh, we live tweeted the crisis and what was happening all around us. Um, and ultimately, we were able to draw the world's attention uh, to the crisis in the Central African Republic. And today, there are 12,000 United Nations peacekeepers on the ground uh, to try to stabilize the situation. And there is an investigation from the International Criminal Court. Obviously, that's only a beginning. This is not a religious war, but it's a, a crisis of deep corruption uh, where the political elite, elite in this country uh, treats the country as its own private bank um, to do with the resources as they wish rather than develop the, the, the country's economy. Um, so it's really important that those underlying causes of the conflict, the corruption, uh, which leads to a violent competition for power. I mean, you basically have mafia groups fighting for control of this country. Uh, um, the corruption has to be addressed. Okay. And um, your other um, groundwork, you've been in many places to do groundwork, but the E-Team film shows you on the ground in Libya during the uprising and the NATO intervention in 2011. What were you able to achieve whilst operating in um, such a dangerous and um, uns unstable country at that point? At the time, uh, in 2011, uh, we had very um, significant access um, on the ground in Libya. Um, the Westerners were not really threatened at that time. Uh, but what we found was a very disturbing situation from the very beginning. Um, obviously, a lot of the international attention was focused on the um, brutality of the Gaddafi forces um, trying to stop this revolution from overthrowing Gaddafi. But we were also very concerned by the conduct of the rebel groups in the country. Uh, we convinced them actually not to use landmines um, during the conflict. Um, <coughs> but we saw them looting vast arms storage facilities that had been collected by Gaddafi mostly from the Eastern Bloc countries and the Soviet Union for decades. Um, and we very quickly warned the international community um, that um, Libya could slide towards chaos um, if the situation of the weapons was not brought under control. And also if the power vacuum um, that came into being after the, the collapse of the Gaddafi regime and ultimately his, his killing, um, if that power vacuum wasn't filled very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, the international community did not act on those recommendations made by Human Rights Watch. Um, and we are now faced with a situation of um, absolute chaos um, in Libya, fighting between different cities, um, a lot of brutality on the ground, uh, literally hundreds of activists and lawyers and people associated with the revolution um, at the beginning have been assassinated, um, particularly in Benghazi um, and other cities in the east. Um, <coughs> and on top of that, because of the chaos which exists um, in Libya, we see the emergence of um, an element of the Islamic State, Daesh, um, in Libya, um, as well as a completely uncontrolled situation with human smuggling. Um, migrants who want to come to Europe being smuggled on unsafe boats um, which leave from Libya and some Egyptian ports and then head to Europe, causing the kind of tragedies of hundreds of lost lives at sea um, that we've been seeing for the last two months already. Um, the debt toll just for these last two months is already about 30 times higher than what we see, saw last year. Um, so we are really bracing for a very deadly summer um, in Europe of both going people trying to reach Europe. Yeah, so these um, refugees um, attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea to enter Europe, um, what are the key drivers for them to decide to make such a dangerous journey since we've seen that they are very dangerous to, to attempt to? Well, this obviously is an issue which has significant relevance for Australia, uh, which has a very hard line and, and my view, 
um, inhuman policy um, on the issue of migration and boat migration. Uh, we have to understand that the people who are taking these boats are absolutely desperate. Um, they're fleeing the situation in Syria, in Gaza, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and they're seeking a better life. They very much know that they're putting their lives at risk and the lives of their children um, to reach Europe. Uh, but the reality is that they have no choice but to flee the situation in their own countries. Um, these are not just numbers, they're individuals, they're people uh, with a name and a history, and we should be doing a lot more to help them, uh, both to make sure that they don't die at sea, um, that the human smugglers, the criminals who put them on these boats, are identified and arrested and prosecuted. Uh, but we should also be welcoming them in greater numbers um, within our societies. I mean, you know, there is all of this media attention to the refugee crisis in Europe. Last year, 600,000 people applied for asylum in Europe. At the same time, one million people sought refuge in Lebanon alone. That's a quarter of the population of Lebanon. Um, the burden on Europe despite all of this press attention and hysteria, frankly, is actually minuscule compared to the burden being carried by Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. Um, these are crises which, to a very significant extent, both in Iraq and Libya, have been created by Western interventions and errors. Um, so we should shoulder a communal responsibility towards these people. Um, and that should include Australia. Australia also has a responsibility to share the burden um, of this global refugee crisis by welcoming migrants to Australia. These are not people who are coming to commit crime. Um, they are often very well accomplished individuals back in their home societies who've saved up for years to seek out a better life. Um, and they can contribute to our societies rather than be a burden. And there has been a lot of um, discussion within the EU and debates about how to respond to the crisis, and they have proposed certain ways of trying to deal with it. But would you then suggest, rather than a, a regional response to the refugee crisis, that it should be a, a, a global one? And if so, how could that actually concretely be made, made possible? Well, one thing is for sure, we don't need Tony Abbott's advice on how to solve our refugee crisis in Europe. We're not going to send the gunboats to push people back at sea. Um, that has a po is a policy which has been tried and it has failed. Um, the problem we face now um, is that the European Union's own policies require that the first country reached by the asylum seeker um, is where that person has to remain. Um, so it means that Italy, which has sent so many of their boats to rescue people at sea, uh, and Greece, which is close by, um, have been left with the, the largest share um, of the burden of refugees. <coughs> Obviously, these are also the poorest societies in Europe. Um, so they're incapable of actually dealing with this burden, uh, let alone providing employment, ultimately, uh, for this large population of refugees, and it has um, led to a very sharp rise in right-wing extremism uh, with groups like Golden Dawn um, in Greece actually going in the streets to attack migrants um, of Afghan and uh, Middle Eastern and African origin. Um, it is, there clearly is movement now in Europe in terms of countries like Germany and some of the Scandinavian countries stepping forward and saying we are willing to take on a larger burden. We have the wealth to be able to do it. Um, but one of the problems is that the Italian um, interception policy, Mare Nostrum, which was designed uh, to save people's lives um, on the seas, has been replaced by what was supposed to be a European Union-wide initiative um, at sea uh, which simply does not have the capacity to, it doesn't have enough boats and enough of a presence to actually rescue people at sea, uh, which is why we see such a sharp rise in the number of uh, people who are drowning in the Mediterranean. But absolutely, this is a crisis which cannot just be contained 
uh, within the Middle East. Um, people will continue to flee to Europe, um, whatever obstacles we put into their way. Um, so we have a choice between either accept accepting them um, and providing legal avenues for them to seek asylum, which after all is a right under international law, um, or to increase the death toll and the suffering by inhuman and degrading policies. And I hope that we will take the higher road um, and seek ways to assist these desperate people uh, rather than to make their lives more difficult. I, I just ask you, um, if this crisis were happening in Europe, if it was German cities who were being bombed uh, rather than Syrian cities and Germans had to flee, would we not think differently about uh, accepting these people in our society? Um, I think that's a question we should all ask ourselves um, and we should be concerned if the answer is yes. Thank you very much for the fascinating interview. Um, I hope, um, I, you know, I wish for you and the All Human Rights Watch team all the best in your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. For more information on the E-Team film, please visit www.hrw.org forward slash E-Team. For analysis of international affairs, please visit, uh, visit our website www.internationalaffairs.org. Thank you very much for watching.